Hello everyone, this is Elias Martin of CollectingJapanesePrints.com. Welcome to Woodblock Wednesday, where on Wednesdays we get together and discuss Japanese prints, paintings, history, and culture. Uh, today's Woodblock Wednesday is actually a real treat um, for me. I pulled out um, a work uh, that's actually very rare that I wanted to share with all of you, and I wanted to accompany this work with a painting that's come into the gallery very recently. So I think uh, both the painting and the print have, uh, have a wonderful sort of conversation uh, occurring. Um, and so it would be wonderful to show these two. Uh, and, and so, you know, in person, they look great, but because you can't be here, um, I'm, I'm showcasing them in the video. And I think, I think you'll enjoy it. So um, without further ado, let's just go to the table and look at what I have. So uh, I have today a woodblock print. This is the first work of two that we'll be discussing today. I have a woodblock print by Nakagawa Isaku. And um, Isaku was a, well, he was a Kansai um, artist. So he was born in Kyoto and produced prints in Kyoto. He was part of the Sosaku Hanga school, for those who uh, those of you don't know, uh, Sosaku Hanga are prints produced entirely by the artist uh, um, himself. The, the artist conceives of the design, carves the blocks, and produces the prints. And unlike uh, Shinhanga or the earlier Edo period style of Ukiyo-e, where it was a collaborative process where the publisher pretty much uh, called the shots, uh, the Sosaku Hanga artists were really self-directed and were producing work that satisfied their own interests. And so in this case, in this particular print, we have a, an image of a moga. And this design is from 1930, I'd say about 31. And um, it depicts, as, as I said, a moga. And a moga is a modern Japanese woman, a young lady who is very, it, it's an, I should say that Moga and her counterpart, Mobo, were very contemporary, they were very modern. Um, these younger people would move into the city, particularly Tokyo. Uh, there was a large sort of move into the city because of factory jobs and other sort of um, jobs of industry, and it allowed younger people to sort of leave their ancestral or family um, homes in prefectures or in areas where there was most, mostly farm and not as much um, densely populated uh, people. And so they moved to Tokyo, and it was sort of the first time in, in Japan's history where younger people could really sort of display their independence. And this was a sort of a phenomena that occurred in the Taisho period into the Showa period, early Showa. And, and it's basically, you know, the men and women, younger men and women that would move in, in, into the, the urban cities and start dressing in a very Western um, way. They, the women in particular, um, were noteworthy because they cut their hair short. And that was something, it was a bit of a taboo um, in Japan. Um, women kept their hair long. And in this time, the fashion, you know, if you can just imagine the flappers of the 20s. Well, this is basically that style. And women would cut their hair short. Um, they would curl the side. It was a very particular type of fashion that they, they were trying to achieve. And, and in, in so doing, in some cases, when they were cutting their hair, uh, they alienated their family. Um, it was, like as I said, it was a big taboo at the time. And so this design really showcases um, th that era. And, and there aren't too many Sosaku Hanga prints that uh, showcase uh, mogas. Um, generally speaking, I don't think there are that many prints, period, that, that showcase uh, mogas or mobos. Uh, the, the designs are actually kind of rare. And the reason why is that in terms of prints and paintings, 
um, the younger generation were participating in, in this in this you know fashion, and they weren't really the ones buying art at the time. Uh, they were too busy going out and enjoying martinis and smoking at, in cafes. And so some of these designs were created for print collectors, people interested in this era. Um, and a lot of these ended up in Western collections. But at, on the whole, mogas and mobos, uh, the subjects in, in prints and paintings, are, are rare also because they're very... Um, they're distinctive to a particular time. And once that time was over, the print artists and paint, painters weren't looking back and, and capturing those moments. They, they were moving on with other things. So what we're really looking at is a snapshot in Japanese um, fashion and, and art history of maybe eight to 10 years at the most. And so anyway, I, this print is a fantastic design that showcases this Moga with her modern hair, haircut, and she's playing pool, and she's trying to do a trick shot. Uh, the shot in pool, I think it's called a grand masse. It's a French term. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. And and so the artist, um, Isaku, is positioning um, his Moga in a very you know, confident way. She's doing one of the hardest trick shots um, in the game. And um, yet she's, she's posed, she's confident, she's focused on what she's about to do, and she's looking uh, quite fashionable. And so we, we have her dressed in the latest fashion with this wonderful striped um, blouse and this dress. Um, it's, a, it's a really wonderful outfit. And in the background, on this particular impression, we have a wonderful application of silver mica. I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to, to tell in, with the lighting, but the background has uh, silver mica applied. Um, so very much like in the style of Goyo or looking back to Utamaro. But this is certainly a design that is, is very different from Goyo's prints. Um, you know, it, it is obviously a print that the artist carved and printed himself, unlike Goyo, um, though Goyo was pretty independent in his own right and produced his own prints through his own studio. Uh, Isako really produced the, the whole design and the print himself. Uh, other things I can tell you about the print is that it's known in different states. Um, it's very rare, but it's known in a different state. There's another impression at the Nihon no Hunga Museum in Amsterdam, and they're, they've produced a couple, couple publications. This, this little book that they produced is great. It's called Feminine and Independent, The Modern Women of Pre-War Japan. And so we have another moga uh, on the cover in a very wonderful uh, pose. She, she's dancing and she's a flapper, as you could see. And, and in this book, uh, this, this, this book is much more comprehensive, Waves of Renewal, Modern Japanese Prints from 1900 to 1960. You know, the print is showcased here as it is showcased a little bit larger in the smaller book. But what you, we could see is the, the print, first of all, this Nihon no Hanga impression lacks the silver mica in the background, which I find interesting. And then the coloration of the blouse is a little bit different. What we see here is in the lines, um, the, the thinner lines are... Sorry about that. My, my connection here is... Um, it's... Okay. Hopefully uh, the connection uh, remains strong uh, for the duration of our Woodblock Wednesday. But anyway, um, what I wanted to point out is that the, it, the, this impression varies quite a bit from the Nihon no Hanga uh, impression. So, you know, that's kind of the fun uh, thing about print collecting. You, you, there's all these wonderful nuances um, in terms of how prints are produced and what they look like um, from impression to impression. Just to fill in the resume for uh, Isaku Nakagawa, you know, he, he was ba primarily based in Kansai and kept uh, an, uh, a tight association with artists 
that were Sosaku Hanga artists in Kansai. Uh, and there weren't that many, but he, you know, he, he had relationships with them and they participated in shows. Um, and, you know, and Kansai was sort of the, the stepchild in printmaking. There was a lot of great artists based in Kyoto, but Tokyo was the center of printmaking. And so it was harder for them to get, gain traction um, in Kyoto. But uh, Nakagawa um, Isaku certainly did. And he produced, uh, I would say, about maybe two dozen designs at the very least. I'm sure there's more, but the ones that I, I'm aware of it's about 24 to 30 prints um, that are known that he produced. Um, and he was also a painter. And um, so in 1960, he moved to the United States. He moved to California and became a professor of Japanese painting at the University of California. And then he was a guest lecturer in different um, um, universities and, and, and institutes. I, I believe he he gave lectures in San Francisco um, at a, a school of design there. And then, you know, he was also awarded the key to the city of San Francisco at some point. So he was quite um, successful in his role as an educator there. But it, what's interesting about Isaku is that um, about 1960, he decided um, to become a potter. He was always interested in, in pottery, and he moved back to uh, the United. Uh, to, he moved back to Japan, and he basically became a a potter. Um, I'm going to zoom in so you could see uh, the print. And so anyway, so he went to he went back to Japan, and um, and I should say uh, he moved to California in 1960, and then he moved back to to Japan in the 70s. I think it was 72, so sorry, I confused some dates. And um, But anyway, he moved back to Japan, and in Japan, actually, Isaku is most known as a potter, not as a woodblock print artist. And so the people who know him as a woodblock print artist are connoisseurs of Sosaku Hanga, but uh, primarily he's known as a, as a potter. So it's interesting how this, this figure became um, well known in, in different areas uh, of life. Moving to, J moving to the United States, he was known as a professor of Japanese painting. But in this early period, he's known to produce these wonderful designs um, of prints. So let me zoom in again so you can see this design up close. It's so great. It's a very rare work. Um, I get asked a lot about this design, and I know of four impressions, period. That's it. Um, one, as I said, is in the Nihon no Hanga Museum. And so that impression, I think, will move on to the Reichs Museum. And there's a, two others in, in private hands, and that's it. So it's quite rare, um, but it's really wonderful to have it here to show uh, all of you. Now, what I, the next thing I want to show, which is really neat, let me just zoom, pan out so you can kind of see the size of the, the print. The print is larger than Oban, um, and it, I would say it's almost the size of two Oban sheets of, of uh, paper, two prints side by side, but not quite. So, you know, and, and it's a particular, his own particular size. The other work I want to point out is a fantastic scroll that I received uh, from a, a great client. And he uh, was uh, very, very pleased with this work as I am. And so I want to be able to show it to all of you. This painting is by Kato Takahisa. And the, the title of the piece is Showa Youth. So the, the work is, depicts two very modern um, people, uh, a young lady and a young man. Uh, this, this work is done about 1931. And uh, it depicts, uh, as I, we were just discussing, a moga and mobo. And um, in this particular case, we have sort of a woman lost in thoughts, sort of looking towards the viewer, but then at, uh, her gaze is very soft and kind of looking out. 
and she's dressed in a really fashionable outfit. Um, and you could see that beautiful yellow scarf, her short haircut, her makeup. She is decidedly modern. I mean, very much modern, very much a woman of her times. And then in the background here, we have a gentleman with a hat, with a pipe, who is smoking his pipe. You could see this really playful wisps of smoke going up. And, and then his very finely tailored Western, Western suit with that really wonderful red tie that just pops. And so th this painting really is indicative of the time that we were just discussing, a time of freedom for the for the Japanese youth who were moving as I, I said to Tokyo and experiencing sort of this new urban um, experience. They were you know going to nightclubs, listening to jazz, smoking, drinking martinis, and, and just living life <laughs> at the fullest. The the interesting thing about this period is that it's 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 sort of a short lived period as I said you know, we, we could trace about maybe eight to ten years of this activity, and then the Japanese government started clamping down. And then we enter into a period of the Dark Valley. And, you know, if you want to learn more about that, I gave a, a seminar very recently about the dark years of the war and the years leading up to World War II and World War II. So if you're interested in learning more about the Dark Valley, as they say, um, it, the years, um, the sort of the lost years where the Japanese were, the, the government was much more focused on military campaigns um, overseas or in the surrounding region. And that really affected culture. It really affected the this, this sense of freedom and, and this newfound sort of liberal way of being. And, and these, these, the, these young couple, this young couple would have been very different 10 years from now. And so the, the youth culture changed radically and the, the sense of optimism and the sense of liberal ideas and, and being able to sort of enjoy life on its own terms was sort of a short-lived idea. And, uh, and so, as I said, this, this, this Taisho into early Showa period of the, the flappers and of the MOBA, MOGA and MOBO um, are very important. And, and in terms of Japanese art history, these images are really striking. They're whimsical, they're fun, and also very different from all the other work that was produced. And, um, and so, you know, because it's so different, it's also rare. And, and so it's a very rare opportunity that I, I can show um, a print and a painting um, almost side by side. So you could see how these different artists um, showcase the, the, this time in, in Japan's history. So I spoke a lot. Now I just want to zoom in closer to the work so you could see. Um, it's a pigment on paper as uh, you might be able to tell. There, uh, there's the title, and then we have the couple. Let me zoom in as I go down. It's a very large scroll, by the way. I'll, I'll, zoom, I'll walk out for a moment. It almost takes up my entire um, wall, and I have about 10-foot ceilings. So this scroll is very, very nice size. And I'll, I'll come down a little bit so you could see her her wonderful shoes, and of course there's the signature with the artist's stamp. Uh, and then, you know, there they are. There's the couple that, you know, most likely they're on their way to a very fashionable event, probably a cafe, sit and have uh, some tea, or maybe it's later in the, in the day, maybe in the evening, and they're headed out to a... Uh, a bar um, and to listen to some jazz. I mean, they're, they're certainly dressed for it. So what I also think um, about this work that I find kind of charming is it's very whimsical, it's very fun, and the way that it's produced, it's, it's done quite quickly. And in this style, you kind of get a sense of 
the energetic quality of the couple and and just the energetic quality of the movements and uh, you know of the style and so this carries over this energetic quality carries over to all of these other designs we've been talking about so this work and then of course the print it's an active uh, design of a woman in the middle of 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 a very difficult trick shot and of course you know this this really famous work that's on the cover of the catalog by Kiyoshi she's in the middle of a dance so we have in these in, in these designs a very active very playful sort of um, moment um, <clears throat> and the other thing I want to point out is that in all three works that we're just discussing the the woman is presented with confidence and or is much more predominant in the design um and so in this case the gentleman is actually in the background and he he's lost some thought as well and he's looking down and she is much more focused on taking the entire composition um for herself though lost in thought kind of looking out um towards the viewer but beyond that but but she is more um, part of the composition, um, she's sort of the anchor of the composition. She's in the center of it all. And, you know, that she's confident. She's confident in her clothing, in her hairstyle. Uh, in order to pull this off, you have to be confident. I mean, you know, you were cutting your hair and possibly being disowned by your parents. You have to be confident. And in, in this case, you know, we, we're talking about... Uh, a trick shot that requires confidence. And so, you know, the, this period uh, of printmaking and, and of, of art really showcases women that are f independent yet feminine and, and strong. And it, that's a really interesting facet of this art that is lost in other areas, in, in my opinion. So it's fascinating. And, you know, these prints and paintings really showcase um, that particular aspect. So I'm going to zoom in on the, both works one last time so you can enjoy them. And I see a lot of us, uh, a lot of people have joined the conversation. So I invite all of you to sort of catch the beginning as well if, if you have some time. And so thank you for joining us. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining me on this installment of Woodblock Wednesday. I hope you enjoyed it. I think this topic of mo, mo gaz and mo bows are, is really fascinating. I think the image, the both images are, are really striking and beautiful, but there's a, so much to them. Uh, and so they're not just striking, beautiful designs. There's so much more. And so I hope that uh, some of the context I provided uh, is helpful. And so, as always, uh, these videos are archived. And so, for those of you watching on YouTube, not live on Facebook, welcome. Um, these, these videos are all produced, as, as I just mentioned, on Facebook Live, but they're archived and uploaded onto YouTube. So, all of my Woodblock Wednesdays are on YouTube, and they're linked on my website, collectingjapaneseprints.com. I invite all of you to have a look at the uh, wood, Woodblock Wednesdays from um, days past, as well as the last few seminars that I've produced. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of information, but also there's a lot of artwork that I've been able, very, very fortunate to be able to share with all of you that is quite rare and important. So, uh, you know, I encourage all of you to have a look at those things as well. And on top of all that, my website has 
beautiful prints and books available for sale. So I encourage you to visit uh, and have a look around. And if there's anything that I could assist with, please contact me. So thanks again for joining me. And I look forward to seeing all of you next week on Woodblock Wednesday. Until then, bye-bye.